They're going to see who's A. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to one A whenever you're ready. Okay. Plan the United States federal government to substantially reduce foreign military sales and direct commercial sales of arms from the United States to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Contention 1 is solvency. First, cutting off arms sales would end the war in Yemen. Only America can provide logistical support and diplomatic cover for Saudi operations. That's Harb 19. Ending American assistance to the Saudi, co uh, the, the Saudi coalition fighting in Yemen would curtail Riyadh's war efforts and hasten the end of the crisis. Experts say that that would have a critical imp impact, said Jordan, a former ambassador to Saudi Arabia, who described U.S. support as crucial to Riyadh's capabilities. If we suspend spare parts for F-15s, the Air Force would be grounded in two weeks, uh, and they will find it more appealing to go to the peace table and negotiate. Washington Riyadh would like to downplay the impact of American involvement in Yemen, but the U.S. role remains extremely important logistically and politically. Beyond military assistance, Washington provides psychological and strategic cover. Saudi the area would feel compelled to end the end that war. And second, the plan would um the plan quickly shuts down the Saudi co coalition's air, air to ground strike capabilities for operations in Yemen. This ends the war and jump starts peace negotiations. That's Goodman 18. Experts, including former senior officials, provide valuable perspectives on how to think about different approaches. The question turns out turns to what to what precise measures Congress should adopt. I focus on the following options: one, bar future FMS relating to air to ground strike capabilities for operations in Yemen to use spending existing DCS license relating to air to ground strike capabilities for operations in Yemen. Three, bar appropriation for in-flight re refueling of Saudi aircraft conducting missions in Yemen. Suspending maintenance of and logistics for existing weapon system may have, may have more immediate uh, um, effects. Riyadh would have no ready, readily available substitute for maintaining and servicing existing systems. We have incredible leverage they can't transform without enormous setbacks and readiness and effectiveness during uh, a year's long transition. A major arms force essentially locks in a department posture for training, spare parts, and tactical upgrades. Options can help curtail MBS. Um, MBS is a misadventure. Shaking the arms relationship is by far the most important way to clip, uh, to clip his wings. He has, he has the region more dangerous and left to his own devices is likely to drag us into a regional conflict. Like options one through three, can, encouraging the Saudis and the UAE, UAE to finally bring the war to a close through political negotiations. If the U.S. decides today it was going to cut off everything to the Air Force, it would be grounded tomorrow. A clean end to the U.S. support is better than uh, the, better than more targeting efforts that, to police that support suspending DCS licenses and placing limits on future FMS would supplement the, the, this approach. Washing our hands of involvement, even in, even in the absence of a diplomatic push, will put pressure to end the conflict. Actions one, two, and three would signal to the Saudis and the Emirates um, that. And that U.S. military assistance will become contingent on progress in political negotiation. That's the only way leaders can uh, can be convinced to pursue a political settlement. Option three was generally considered weak on its own due to, to Saudi's ability to replace U.S. refueling. Contention two is humanitarian crisis. First, Saudi coalition uses U.S. weapons uh, to commit war crimes in Yemen. New arms sales will be used direct to directly kill thousands of civilians. That's Laris in 19. Trump uh, hopes to exploit any loophole key, to, to keep funneling oil weapons that they bring death and destruction on civilians. The Saudis and the Emirates uh, deliberately target non-military states. War planes have conducted 13 attacks per day. The coalition has bombed schools, hospitals, markets, mos uh, mosques, farms, factories, roads, bridges, power plants, water treatment facilities, even a potato chip factory. Continue to continue arming uh, is, is to no one provide war criminals with means to commit more war crimes. Uh, Congress needs to block uh, to block for the sake of uh, civilians. The coalition will otherwise kill the, with, with these weapons. Second, 233,000 Yemenis, including 140,000 children, will die in 2019 unless the U.S. blocks arms sales to the coalition of Bosnia 19. Sales will prolong suffering and eliminate influence. Um, the death toll could rise to 233,000. The conflict has turned into a war on children with, 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 with child dying. Every 12 minutes, 140,000 killed uh, would, would be children under five. Uh, five. And third, the U.S. has a moral obligation to end arms sales to, uh, to the coalition. It is otherwise complicit in, the on in their ongoing war crimes with Flair since 18. Uh, continued assistance to governments that have routinely struck civilian targets and killed thousands is important when our government has reason to believe assistance will be used to commit human rights abuses and war crimes. It is obligated to withhold the coalition, relies on the U.S. Uh, assistance to wage their war and would not be able to continue it without that support. Trump refuses to hold them accountable even when they commit the most egregious war crimes. U.S. support is essential to their war and, and that makes our, our government deeply complicit in what that coalition does. Fourth, the plan's clear signal, uh, clear signal of U.S. disapproval would override other supportive uh, Trump administration policies that spin till 19. An embargo would cut through the noise, stopping the transfers it is an effective way to signal dissatisfaction and cause the need to rethink their behavior. Take Israel in the 60s. A denial would mean Saudi Arabia would have to rethink that, that it has political support and approval. Now it's having an effect even before transport is completed. Even the announcement could have an effect. This would be an important first step in changing behavior because it would override other statements and actions. An embargo would be a clear and unambiguous signal. 
Finally, U.S. arms sales are the crucial enabler of the Saudi's coalition continued operations. They guarantee that, that the quagmire deepens as right of 19. Uh, Some of won't help Saudi's biggest problem, the quagmire in, in Yemen. Houthi stepped up attacks to respond to the, to the refusal to cease airstrikes. Saudis uh, blame Iran behind the, uh, the, the summit is a disastrous failure of decision making that led to an intervention in Yemen. The signature initiative of the Crown Prince, thanks to his leadership, Saudi sites and infrastructure are, are now the big uh, targets for a once, uh, uh, for a once rag military militia that has developed sophisticated drones and missiles. The war is the worst humanitarian catastrophe in the world. The decision to sell billions of arms without congressional approval will encourage the, the Crown Prince to continue the quagmire. Saudis are not, are not more capable of winning with more munitions. American support has singularly failed to prevent bombing civilian targets or reducing the carnage. Contention three is Middle East stability. First, Yemeni conflict causes direct Saudi Iran war and spills over to the entire Middle East. That's Musali 15. Yemen is not only dangerous for domestic region, there is a real risk of contagion of, throughout the Gulf. Further, um, uh, further escalation will cause military and major instability and conflict consequences would be felt across the world. Yemen is, is a token of increasing struggle between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Direct confrontation between Saudi Arabia and Iran could result escalation would have severe repercussions across oil markets. Yemen is adjacent to Hormuz, most important the short point, and to Bal Bab al, -Al, -Al Manab, which controls the Suez uh, dis disruptions would result in increased volatility. The supply over him could, dis could diminish Yemen's inherent instability and its forward board, uh, board borders pose a direct threat to Saudi Arabia and, and Oman. And Yemen is dangerously combustible. Saudi airstrikes are not, are not Likely to produce a settlement, regional instability will lead to full blown conflict with any major powers. Second, a broader Saudi Iran conflict would, would escalate and lead to mutual retaliation between the Iran and the U.S. as Hughes 19. If Saudi Arabia perceiving an attack by Iran were to, were to attack Iran, Tehran would have to authorize Hezbollah to attack Saudi um, the U.S. and AAB assets. Those could occur on Saudi UAE territory or, or in Syria, Iran, or, uh, Syria, Iraq, or Bahrain. Trump would authorize retaliatory am am flight strikes no matter his claim or, or of not wanting war. If, if Iran were targeted, it is equally likely he would initiate regional conflagration. A bad situation could become worse if China, Russia, or both use the opportunity to drive the U.S. into Middle East war. Um, you know, by, by supplying Iran, uh, uh, by supplying Iran with weapons, that that would uh, would enable to receive the U.S. Uh, uh, to see how the U.S. would counter those weapons, reducing surprises in the, in the uh, CS or Ukraine. Third, other great powers will get drawn in. The Middle East is a vital region to, uh, to international security. That's over um, 18. Saudi Iran conflict is unlikely that such a conflict would involve only those two, and, and not going to involve other states. Um, Iran have, have a robust international alliance with non-state clients. Hezbollah or um, Assad al, al haq would, would not support Iran. Saudi Arabia has a strong alliance with the U.S., UAE, Jordan, and, and the um, U.S. It is difficult to imagine the U.S. would not become involved. Fourth, now is a key time. Escalation of Yemen, land, Yemen conflict is likely. That's hindsight 18. The, the, uh, the, great, uh, the Great East War of 2019, uh, Israel seems to willing to risk escalation without thus far sparking confrontation. Complacencies on war to confrontation resulted from unintended escalation. The dynamic between Israel and Iran, the acts of resistance are formal for a third war as possible. A multiple front and threatens on land, air, sea, info, and cyber fighters from Hezbollah, Iraq, Iran, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, Yemen, and widen the scope will create new military options for Iran and will stretch Israeli uh, credibility. If war is launched, this could open the way for uh, for the air uh, world to participate war is most likely as a result of unintended escalation that could start as a result of the US strike on Iran. Finally, Yemen uh, Yemen crowns the Middle East for a nuclear escalation of Wojcik um, in 19. Humanity faces dire existential threats. Trump moved to cancel the nuclear arms reduction according with Iran against the backdrop of an unstable Middle East. A, gen a genocidal war in Yemen. Saudi Arabia, US backing the region provides an excellent opportunity for the outbreak of nuclear war. Bolton brags how no options are off the table to what the US might do to Iran. Okay, so a lot of the one I see is premised off the instability and violence in Yemen being bad. So I want to ask about what, how that changes post-affirmative. I guess, is there a political settlement in Yemen? And if so, what does it look like? Uh, the Goodman evidence says that if Saudi Arabia no longer had U.S. arms, they would be unable anymore to carry out their air and ground operations in Yemen, yeah, which okay. would mean they would, have, they would be forced to come to the table with the Houthis, their enemies, and have a power-sharing negotiation okay. agreement in Yemen that would so, lead to more yeah. stability. I want to ask about the link between those two things. So you've said that Saudi Arabia no longer has arms, and then you've said that because they don't have arms, they'll cooperate with their enemy, their enemy of their whole kingdom that they've been at war with for four years. What incentive is there for them to negotiate with? They them? have no other choice if they don't have arms sales anymore because that's the backbone of their military and they're okay. unable to carry out operations without those. Okay, so what incentive do Houthis have to come to the table because they're winning the war now because Saudi Arabia, as you just said, has no weapons left. We would disagree that the Houthis were winning the war. The, Houthi, oh, the Houthis are not 
only Houthis are fighting because Saudi Arabia is fighting. If the Saudi Arabians proposed a peace settlement where the Houthis got significant political power mm -hmm. in a peacetime Yemen, they would accept that Wait, because that's all they've been requesting for four years. Wait, you're saying that Houthis are only fighting because Saudi Arabia is fighting? Yes, they the want to control Yemen oh, yeah. peacefully or have power here in Yemen peacefully. So, if Saudi Arabia proposes yeah, that, they, they want to peacefully take over another country. They were the ones that overthrew the democratically elected government. And you're saying that they did that defensively? We're saying that the Houthis for 20 years have demanded power in the Yemeni government, and they did try to overthrow the government, but a scenario in which Saudi Arabia is no longer able to fight would be a more stable Yemen with negotiations okay. sharing power between Houthis and okay. that government that you So even if I spot before. you completely, let's say you're completely right that the Houthis and Saudi Arabia negotiate. What you were saying earlier, and you started to say in one of your questions answers, was that there are other conflicts in Yemen. There's a southern kingdom that wants independence. There's ACAP, and your own evidence says Hezbollah has gone involved. How do you stop those conflicts? Uh, Hezbollah, first off, Hezbollah's involved because uh, of the Saudi war and Iran being involved with the Houthis. That would end post plan. What ev do you have that says Hezbollah pulls out? Or like the Hezbollah Southern Kingdom would the, stop wanting independence? I think it's the Ostavar card that says that a, 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 a actual military confrontation between the Saudi Arabians and the Iranians would involve Hezbollah. Okay. Right now they're not involved in Yemen, they're involved in Lebanon, yeah. which is so, their um, base. Okay, so I want to ask about that. Your Eisenhower evidence says, quote, there are multiple fronts for war, Hezbollah, Iran, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Mm -hmm. How do you solve any of those conflicts? We've isolated that the Middle East war is, the only conflict in the Middle East that's potential to escalate is No, Yemen. no, no. Actually, because your F says the opposite. The, the piece of F you have is tag that, but then it says, a general style war, Yemen, and then it says the region overall provides an excellent opportunity for the outbreak of nuclear war. Yes, uh, we agree that basically Yemen is the spark to those broader conflicts. It's the only place where there's actual direct military confrontation That's between not two what countries. Is. That is what it says. So first off, the uniqueness. Russian arms sales are static, but limited by strong market dominance by the U.S. Russia has the capacity and desire for rapid growth, Sakio 19. Russia has maintained its arms exports despite pressure. We, all, uh, we know under which pressure Russia is. Uh, this is an example of unfair competition. There are attempts to prevent us from entering new markets. Washington has sought to tighten diplomatic pressure on countries that import Russian arms. The U.S. is also looking to incentivize the purchase of American-made weapons. That switch from importing to Russia as part of its bid to boost arms sales. Russia is devising a new strategy uh, that should account for U.S. efforts to inhibit Russian arms sales. B, the link. Russia capitalizes on U.S. arms reductions. Those exports are key to their financial and political dominance over the West. It's a zero-sum trade-off. Uh, Borshev Skava, 918. Uh, Russia is second only to the U.S. Arms sales are a major source of financial gain, but also a tactical foreign policy instrument. Countries turn to Moscow when it wants to diver uh, diversify away from the West. Russia's influence in the region is growing in the context of Western retreat. Putin worked to raise uh, Russia to a competitor to the U.S. by increasing the emphasis on Russia's arms. Arms exports are an, an instrument for advancing uh, Moscow's interest. Russia's sales are the most important element of Moscow's relations, and regime survival run uh, runs counter to Western interests and values. See the impact. Unchecked Russian influence risks extinction. Fisher 15. Today's Russia calls to mind the German Empire. A rising power propelled by nationalism is seeking to revise the order. The drift towards war is easy to miss, which makes it so dangerous. Uh, mutual suspicion makes a central threat. Armies across borders and nuclear weapons make any skirmish in Arm uh, Armageddon. Russia has dr um, dramatically relaxed its rules for using nuclear weapons. A terrifyingly low bar. A limited nuclear strike trigger a larger nuclear war. Limited studies suggest that environmental damage would cause a decade of winter. Now on to the humanitarian crisis advantage. First, the plan won't end the war. The coalition can continue without the U.S. support and there are multiple conflicts. Uh, uh, Catullus and Corbin 18. There is a difference between ending involvement uh, versus ending a war. Groups ignore complicated realities driving conflicts. Uh, those and the suffering uh, are not likely to end because Congress legislates an end to U.S. involvement. And even if they end the war, instability is inevitable because of Iran. Tobin 19. 
But the notion that helping a government more despotic than the Saudis gain an advantage will protect human rights is absurd. To eliminate the U.S. role would give the Houthis, uh, whose human rights record is even uh, is worse, a leg up. The Saudis are the lesser of two evils. A mentality in which America backs a bad actor to stop a worse one remains the only sensible policy. A vote to end involvement uh, won't advance peace or human rights. All it will do is give a dangerous victory to Iran. And the peace treaty will be circumvented. Disregard for ceasefire proves. Maritime Executive 19. Despite a UN-backed ceasefire, fighting between uh, Houthi rebels and government forces has resumed. Houthi units had shelled several neighborhoods under the terms of an agreement negotiated uh, last December. Houthi rebels were to withdraw, but considerable work remains to demilitarize. And no moral obligation. In this context, ignoring consequences causes a greater injustice. Disads are morally relevant. Uh, Heinrichs 18. If the moral decision is to be made, cooler heads must prevail. Insisting that one uh, prioritize either morality or realism is a false choice. There is no foreign policy action or inaction without moral consequence. Those shouting justice for Khashoggi could be rushing into catastrophe that creates uh, greater injustice. Uh, the, the government must wait to determine uh, the just thing. Damaging the alliance will not decrease suffering. Ending sales would play right into the hands of enemies. Doing the moral thing does not require the U.S. to advantage us to seek to harm us. Partnering is not choosing among lesser evils. Partnering is doing, is doing the most good. And now onto the Middle East stability advantage. First, no Middle East war. External actors will limit damage, not intervene. Stepanova 16. In the 2010s, the role and leverage of major powers external to the Middle East as meddlers declined rather than increased. Regional powers uh, appeared to outplay external powers and influence. Uh, the response by key external powers to turbulent Middle East uh, boils down to limited containment. Despite the growing centrality of the Middle East in global politics and security, this damage limitation course has been, uh, has been the approach taken by the US, uh, US, Russia, and China to Afghanistan. Two, no escalation. Multilateral institutions, nuclear deterrence, and political weariness all check. Lubin 14. Many compared the present to 1914. Evans' key difference includes balancing uh, tendencies on the multipolar world as well as the emergence of institutions of collective security, which makes a big difference. People have learned from history. We're much more cautious. Nuclear weapons give political leaders the equivalent of a crystal ball that shows what their world would look like after escalation. The crystal ball effect had a strong influence on the Cuban Missile Crisis. It would likely have a similar influence today. Three, no withdrawal into the Middle East conflict. Countries, uh, countries have mutual interest in uh, containing instability. Need 14. Events in Iraq and Syria suggest that the Middle East could be in for a carnage on my people, uh, but the analogy breaks down. Neither China nor any ally is competing directly with the U.S. All it really wants in the Middle East is quiet. There's another difference, uh, alliance systems. The global U.S. alliance system has no rival, while Ru China, Russia, and a handful of lesser powers are disengaged. The military ba uh, balance isn't even close. Do you want me to go ahead and read this alliance no, system? Okay, all right. I'm done. I'm going to cross. Uh, so on the Russian side, right. what is like the scenario for war? Right, unchecked Russian influence in the Middle East starts uh, competing against Western influences in the Middle East. Obviously, and these small skirmishes between the two have the potential to escalate into a nuclear war. Yes, as the So it's the Russia and the U.S. So what is the small skirmish? Any skirmish between Russia and U.S. interest in the Middle East, any kind of proxy conflicts, any any con any confrontation between Russian and U.S. forces or Russian. Okay. And so why would past conflicts like in Ukraine or other Russian expansion of not? Occur? Because Russia is looking to expand its influence now a lot more than it has been in the past. Why? Like how are you quantifying it? I mean, arms sales, as of right now, according to the uniqueness, right, arms sales are like their key tool uh, for expanding their influence. Right now, their arms sales are really low. Russia is looking to expand their sales in other areas and thus expand their So influence. why are arms sales key? Because that's like their biggest export. Russia exports a ton of arms, and that's what they build all their alliances on top of. Uh, if Russia isn't able to like sell all these arms to all these so, countries, guess, then they don't get their alliances. But they're not. And so. They're not currently selling arms to the countries, right? They're so not why are these nothing. new sales key to Russia's alliances? Because you say arms sales are key to their alliances, but why would Russia need to form a new alliance? Right, okay. So it's not necessarily that arms sales are absolutely key to all of their alliances. It's that these arms sales are particularly key to Russian influence in these regions. They need to start selling more arms because they're trying to build up more influence in the regions, especially the Middle East. That's why you know, Russia is looking to expand its arms markets, especially in the places like Saudi Arabia, where they can start getting more influence in these regions. So. So what's I'm gonna go back to the first question. Why why do Russian arms sales in Saudi Arabia? What kind of regional conflict would emerge from that? I mean any conflict between Saudi and like all the conflicts Saudi Arabia is like perpetuating now. I mean we're just Russia would just perpetuate those. And it puts Russia in direct conflict with Western interests in the region, which again as the card lays out, you know, leads to skirmishes which have the potential and would likely uh, end up escalating into the nuclear conflict. Okay, so why don't other, um, actually, uh, oh, 
Oh yeah, why would why would Russia be why would Saudi Arabia buy from Russia? Why wouldn't they buy from another country? Because they're looking to buy from whoever's going to sell. I mean, not whoever's going to sell. Well, Russia's one close. Uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia have also done a little bit of negotiating in the past, especially over specific missile systems. So Russia's not like a completely new client to Saudi Arabia. Um, I mean, they have the two have diplomatic ties already. Um, so I mean, it's just an easy open market. All right, that's good. Two ACs in the sun. The order will be the humanitarian crisis advantage, the Middle Eastern stability advantage, and then the Russia fill in dissent. And before we start, one ACs. Everybody ready? Good. Arms sales to Saudi Arabia enable genocidal violence in Yemen. The Saudis are using U.S. weapons to bomb schools, hospitals, and villages, leading to the deaths of 233,000 people every year. This makes the United States complicit in these atrocities, but reducing the sales forces Saudi Arabia to end the war and saves thousands of lives. You have a moral obligation to stop. This form of violence. Their first argument is that the plan doesn't end the war, but ending arms sales ends all the devastation. First, it's spare parts and maintenance. Saudi Arabia relies on continuous U.S. provision of parts and maintenance support. Without it, their air force is grounded within two weeks. That's the harm and good evidence. You should prefer those cards because it cites the former U.S. ambassador to Saudi Arabia who has a unique knowledge of their needs. Second is peace negotiations. The plan gives all parties a break from physical conflict, which generates political will for negotiations and sends a signal for peace. That's Goodman and Spindle evidence. The next argument says instability is inevitable, but this is just not true. Even if there is low-level instability, we still solve millions of lives and simply decrease the risk of escalation. Political settlement solves because the Houthis will not involve Iran post-plan. And reject the argument that we should arm terrible actors against other bad actors. It justifies our arming the Latin American dictators to fight communism. Instead, we should just stay, we should end the wars that are allowing these people to commit atrocities in the first place. They said the tree is circumvented, but it's not. It's descriptive of the status quo. Because of arms, they are violating it because negotiations aren't lasting, and the Saudis are still airstriking Yemen, which incents Houthi retaliation. The plan gives the Houthis a situation they can live with, which the Riedel card says the only arms sales give both sides to them to keep perpetuating the violence, but the plan changes the calculus of both sides. Finally, they said there's no moral obligation, but the U.S. is actively participating in war crimes and human rights violations against civilians. Our impact comes first because there are no possible justification for allowing these forms of violence to persist. That's the Larison part. On to the Middle East advantage. The war in Yemen leads to a military conflict between the Iranians and the Saudi Arabians. That causes direct strikes in the two countries that force involvement by the United States, China, Russia, and other regional countries, culminating in the use of nuclear weapons that kill millions. They have conceded that Middle East war is happening inevitably if we don't do the app. Even if Russia isn't involved, which is all the level their cards amount to, it still kills millions of people. Think back to the Iraq war and Syria war. They said no Middle East war, but Yemen is the essential battleground between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Continued fighting ends the limited containment their evidence talks about. And miscalculation and pressure to retaliate to perceived acts of war from the Houthis in Saudi Arabia means both sides have to escalate. That's Musali. Second, they said that there's no escalation, but those checks assume countries trying to avoid war. That's not true here. First, John Bolton in the U.S. is looking for an excuse to attack. That's Washington and Mussolini says Saudi Arabia will perceive Iran attacking them, which means they have to retaliate. Prefer our evidence to Tebanova is running before Trump, which can assume current geopolitical trends and relationships. Finally, they said no drawing. But Meade doesn't assume that the U.S. would start the war. That creates Russian and Chinese intervention to help Iran, with whom they have strong economic, military, and diplomatic ties, and they value their oil relationships in the region, which means they have to get involved to protect those relationships. That's the Hughes and Ostevar evidence. Then again, even if those countries don't get drawn in, still millions of people die, which outweighs the low risk of the Russian dissent. Go on to the dissent now. First, interoperability prevents the shift. Neg authors misunderstand the global arms trade. French, 18. The Saudi military is highly dependent on the advanced American weaponry. They can't just waltz over to a different country without suffering enormous setbacks in readiness and effectiveness during a years-long transition. A major arms purchase essentially locks the purchasing nation in for training, spare parts, and technical upgrades. Trump's claim that the Saudis could go to China or Russia betrays an odd ignorance about Russian arms. 
Their most advanced weapons aren't ready for prime time. If the Saudis are terrified that Iran purchasing worse weapons that would require new training, spare parts, and relationships is a terrible option. Buying weapons for Alpha is not like choosing between a Honda Accord and a Toyota Camry where you can just walk across the street and get a similar product. Second, the affirmative prevents the negative's impact. Middle East war is coming now and will cause Russia to expand their influence and fight against the US. Only the app defuses those tensions. Third, arms sales don't increase Russian power or influence. Reeves 18. Russian arms sales strategic pull is weakening. Influence and leverage are transitory. Russia's focus on short term political gains in lieu of far side plans limited use of arms exports. Sales have merely supportive relationships, not an anti Western coalition. Arms do not mean that Russia's overall strength and influence rise. States will continue to gain reverse leverage on Russia. Exports are quickly becoming a dull and impractical instrument. Fourth, the impact has already happened. Russia has been aggressive for 20 years, which is proven by invasions of Ukraine, Crimea, Georgia, and Syria. There is no chance that gaining a single arms market is sufficient to improve their influence over the current level. Fifth, Russian exports are high, increasing, and resilient to U.S. influence now. Episcopos 19. Russia's chief arms exporter is seeing record profits, setting the Russian defense industry up for its strongest grossing year in decades. This cannot be dismissed as a one-off occurrence. Rosa Boran's exports portfolio has steadily grown over the past decade. India signed a gargantuan weapons deal with Russia. Washington successfully sanctioned China, but this had no discernible effect on the emerging Sino-Russian defense relationship. Moscow exploited the growing political rift between Turkey and the West to secure a joint Russian-Turkish manufacturing deal. Rosa Boran Export plans to make further inroads in Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, and Central Asia with a glut of cheaper hardware that may lack bells and whistles, but offers cost-effective performance for low and medium-intensity warfare. Rosa Boran Export's ongoing success shows no signs of changing over the coming years. Russia's remarkably resilient arms export business is thriving. Six, the affirmative outweighs the dissat. The Yemen war involves all major countries, while the dissat only involves Russia and the U.S., which means it's categorically bigger. Seven, Russian economy is strong and growing now. Oil stock market and failure of sanctions. Phillips 19. Bragging rights for the world's hottest major stock market belongs to Russia. The combination of surging Russian share prices and a buoyant ruble has generated some of the best investment returns on earth. There are fundamental economic reasons for the rally, most notably the rebounding price of crude oil. The performance also reflects investors' growing confidence that the U.S. isn't going to take further actions that would imperil Russia's economy. The Treasury Department lifted sanctions. Eight, no link. Russia will never sell arms to Saudi Arabia. They're already in alliance with Iran, who is Saudi Arabia's worst enemy. They would not risk Iranian anger and the collapse of that alliance, which would result from selling to the Saudis. Ninth, Russia is not a revisionist threat. Their impact is wildly exaggerated. Gotch, 19. Be skeptical about revanchist Russia. The liberal order has significantly fluctuated. Russian revisionist behavior should not be exaggerated. Ukraine can remain relatively limited. Doubtful Moscow has a blueprint for an alternative international order. Revanchist Russia is unable to account for instance, which Moscow has adhered to the existing liberal order, Iran nuclear deal, the World Trade Organization, and the Court of Human Rights. Methods hardly fit with a revisionist imperial agenda. Russia is by no means unique in its quest to establish influence. It faces an array of explanatory challenges and shortcomings. Ten, settlement solves. The Goodman card says reducing U.S. arms forces Saudi Arabia to negotiate peace. That means they will no longer have demand for Russian arms because they won't be fighting in a military conflict anymore. Eleven, if failing happens, it's with China, not Russia. Halder 19. China is emerging as a fast-growing supplier of affordable high-tech weapon systems The country is facing restrictions from the West. The China International Aviation and Aerospace Exhibition was just one sign of China's growing clout in a field traditionally dominated by the West, Russia, and Israel. China is fast positioning itself as an attractive supplier of affordable high-tech military hardware. The country's willingness to sell to virtually anyone gives China a distinct edge, and its ability to deliver high-tech machines at a cheaper rate than competitors also attracts buyers. 12. No U.S.-Russian War uh, no false rhetoric, defense of Russia, deterrence. Ignore the threatening the fear mongering. Tsiangov, 16. Whatever the rhetoric, major powers are not inclined toward risky behavior. Russia remains a defensive power. Moscow wants to work with major powers, not against them. Insistence on Western recognition of Russia's interests must not be construed as a drive to destroy the foundations of the international order. The U.S. military and diplomatic resources are sufficient to restrain key regional players in any part of the world. Proxy wars are unlikely to escalate. Mars card is unlikely to escalate. I'm ready for proxy wars. So first, I want to ask about, uh, let's go to the humanitarian crisis flow. Mm -hmm. uh, you're saying the treaty circumvention stuff is descriptive of the status quo now, yeah. right? If you're in, uh, this whole treaty circumvention argument is in the context of the Houthis not listening to the treaty. Your answers are in yeah. the context of Saudi Arabia listening to the treaty. Even if Saudi Arabia listens, let's say you're right, 
then how does that at all solve like the who these not? Well, I disagree with your contextualization of our argument. Our argument is that if this, the reason the Houthis are circumventing the treaty now is because they fear Saudi Arabian attacks. For example, Saudi Arabia still carries out airstrikes on Yemeni towns and attempting to attack the Houthis. The only reason the Houthis are violating this treaty is because they see that they have to Wait, and they have okay, no choice so in order to backlash and retaliate okay, so against Houthis, Saudi aggression. So the Houthis were like fine with Saudi Arabia when the Saudi revolution started? If, because they Saudi were fine Arabia with Saudi Arabia like, as long as the Saudis okay. were not attacking their bases and villages, okay, as so, long as so Saudi Arabia Houthis was not trying to oust their power. So you're saying the Houthis were not at all aggressive towards Saudi Arabia? Before Saudi Arabia started airstriking. No, they, yeah. when the Houthis took power in 2015, so they had no incentive to go to war against Saudi Arabia. Because okay. Saudi Arabia is a bigger country in power than them. The only reason they're retaliating is because Saudi Arabia okay. is attacking That's us fine. first. We can go on to the Middle East stability flow now. Uh, so, Yemen's is a central battleground. You guys made that argument? Like we you did. said, the Houthis took power in like 2015. If it's such a, like in the central battleground, why hasn't you know everything spiraled up by now? Well, I have years? two things about this. First, we established a brink argument, saying that as the longer this war goes on, the propensity to escalate increases. Second, we have evidence that when you see the ice from 2019, the isolates that the war is currently shifting strategies from low-level ground okay. operations to the Houthis conducting okay. strikes back at Saudi Arabian territory, okay. which increases the risk that Saudi Arabia sees Iran is attacking them and has to strike okay. Iran. That's cool. Let's go to the Russia flow for a second. Uh, fourth argument, the impact has already happened because Russia is aggressively expanding into Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, twelfth argument, there's no war because Russia is a defensive power. Which one of those uh, portrayals are we supposed to be? Uh, they're not contradictory portrayals. Russia is being aggressive now. We would argue that Russia that can't be aggressive. We would argue that that aggression is not because they want to upend the entire international order, but because they're afraid of things like NATO expansion, democracy efforts within their traditional okay. sphere of influence sure. like Ukraine, okay. and Middle Eastern regime changes. Russia okay. is a, being aggressive and invading now, which disproves escalation and proves that there's no way okay. the Afghan the Afghan increases that more. Um, but there's no es there's no bar on nuclear conflict okay. that you said. Which I have a question about your part. tenth argument. The settlement solves, right? Because the Saudis just magically stop needing a military. Um, why would the Saudis yeah. not still need guns? Well, they would need they would need a low basis of a military. We're not saying that. We're saying that the reason right. the Saudis okay, so need so many arms. Now right. is that the is that they are fighting yeah. a war in Yemen? But they if still need not guns from somewhere after agreed. the settlement, right? Yes, okay. but the argument right. is that you have to win that Russian influence and money expands massively. Okay. Saudi Arabia will not buy the same volume of arms from Russia as they do from the U.S. Now, since the war will be over and they won't need that same volume. Okay. is going to be first the humanitarian crisis advantage and then the Middle East war advantage. Okay, all good. The framing issue for this advantage is that the affirmative does not solve the war in Yemen. It does not prevent the conflict that is ongoing. It removes one factor, namely the arms sales that occurred in Saudi Arabia, but does not remove the, overlying, the underlying cause. There are two arguments here. First is that there are multiple conflicts occurring in Yemen. Houthis are not a monolith. Rather, there are many branches of the Houthis. There's no central government in place. Iran is present, the UAE is present, and the southern kingdom in Saudi Arabia all wants independence. Even though the app might remove Saudi Arabia from the mix, those are six other independent actors who still have conflicting interests, which means war will go on, and the conflict that Meacham described at the start of his speech will continue. Meacham said in 1AC Crossex that Hezbollah is already in Yemen. What incentive is there for Hezbollah to move out of the region, especially after Saudi Arabia, their biggest threat, removes from the region? Instead, 
there's an incentive for Iran and Hezbollah to expand, which will only increase the risk of war. Which means not only does the AF not solve the war, they actively make it worse. The piece of evidence reread in the 1NC, the 1NC Tobin evidence, says that Iran is involved in the region. But the only reason that they're not expanding across Yemen completely is because Saudi Arabia has access to US arms. Post-affirmative, Saudi Arabia is no longer present, as Meacham said in his own speech, which makes it more likely that Iran will cause instability in the region. I'm going to read more evidence about there being other conflicts that the AF does not solve. That's Biden 18. An end to the intervention is overdue, but even if it occurs, don't expect Yemen's nightmare to close. It might be coupled with a broader pullout of foreign powers and a ceasefire. An end to the intervention would only be the beginning. The UAE would still be militarily involved and is much more active a player than Saudi Arabia. On the ground, local actors would continue to fight. Terrorist groups would remain active. An end to the intervention is a first step, but by itself will not be enough. Now, Meacham starts off his speech describing the genocide that is ongoing. Before you can evaluate this, you need to answer two questions. First, do they solve this? All of the analysis I did above proves that bombing, the fighting, terrorist attacks continue post-affirmative. Second, even if they win, that they solve airstrikes on civilian places like hospitals, you need to weigh that uh, conflict against the magnitude of the disadvantage. We have said that the AF causes a nuclear war on a global level, which far outweighs on scale the amount of people dying than just the war in Yemen. Second, they said that Saudi Arabia no longer has the capacity to fight post-affirmative. Well, the piece of evidence rewritten on the 1NC, the 1NC Katulis and Corp evidence, says that because Saudi Arabia sells oil for billions of dollars each year, they have enough money to either one, fund and increase their own military efforts post-affirmative, or they'll buy it from other actors. Here's more evidence that says that the coalition can keep bombing for years even after the US cuts off arms sales. That's Knights 18. Based on pre-war stocks and replacements, Riyadh could keep bombing at its current rate for several years, even if all new PGM deals were rejected. Cutting off sales would not meaningfully slow the air campaign anytime soon. Now, they say that the AF results in a peace treaty. That's the second argument I'm going to make here. You should ask yourself, what incentive is there for Houthis to negotiate? The only reason they're willing to come to the table now is because they're afraid of Saudi Arabia. They're afraid of the United States. Think about it. Post-affirmative, their biggest enemy in the region has been removed. They no longer think they have any obstacle to take over all of Yemen. Any rational leader in the Houthi military would realize that it's in their incentive to expand even more rapidly post-affirmative. Now, Meacham tries to say that Houthis are a defensive power, but he admitted by himself that Houthis started the conflict when they overthrew the democratically elected government of Yemen, which proved that Houthis are the aggressors and they'll be even more aggressive post-affirmative. But the only way that we can stop uh, this conflict and create a negotiation is with US power. The plan makes it less likely that Houthis will negotiate. That's May 18. A negotiated settlement would be welcome, but these are not let's make a deal kind of guys. Can anyone believe that they will be more amenable to a compromise if the military pressure is eased? Now, they say that we should reject the logic of arming bad guys. But although it might not be pretty that we need to arm Saudi Arabia, we need to consider the lesser, lesser of two evils. Saudi Arabia certainly isn't perfect, and they might be causing civilian deaths in Yemen. But Iran and Russia are far, far worse, and they're far more likely to cause deaths. You need to evaluate that as a policymaker. It might seem morally ethical on face to say we should pull out of the region, but you need to consider the consequences of such an action. I'm going to go on to the other advantage now. Now, the framing issue for this advantage is that the war has been going on for four years. It's been going on for four years and nothing has escalated. And all of the reasons I give below will substantiate why that hasn't escalated. There are two arguments here. First is that Saudi, Saudi Arabia and Iran don't want to go to war. The Lubin evidence says that they prefer a proxy conflict that is localized to Yemen because it means that they don't have to expend a lot of economic and military power. Remember, that Saudi Arabia is, is, a re, is a country, and like Iran, that don't have a lot of economic capacity to expend in an all-out war. It's in their interest to draw down. Second, the Stepanova evidence says that both countries, Saudi Arabia and Iran, are dependent on foreign powers. Remember when Meacham talked about China and Russia getting drawn in? Well, 
China and Russia are nowhere near as dependent on Iran as Iran is on, on China and Russia. It is much more likely that instead of China and Russia deploying military, they'll just pressure Iran because Iran knows that they rely on countries like China and Russia for things like energy cooperation, funding, alliances, and we, which means that greater powers like China and the United States would just convince Saudi Arabia and convince Iran to not go to war because it's in everybody's interest to draw down. Now, Meacham tries to get out of this argument by saying that the United States will start the war. I mean, they have first, they have no evidence to substantiate this, that Bolton secretly wants a nuclear war with Iran. The fact that Trump threatened to first strike Iran, but then right before he did strike, he draw down and decided not to, proves that Trump is a rational actor insofar as he realizes that war with Iran would destroy his presidency. He's an America first president. He doesn't want to deploy ground troops in another quagmire when his whole presidency, his whole brand, is built off criticizing foreign intervention. Now, even then, we should realize that even if the United States struck, uh, struck Iran, our evidence says that it is much more likely that China and Russia would stay out of the conflict. Now, Meacham's warrant for why they would get into the conflict is to stabilize oil prices. But China and Russia realize that a long nuclear war would obviously spike oil prices more than anything else, which means it's much more likely that they'll default to diplomatic cooperation. The only argument they have to respond to this line of argumentation is that miscalculation and retaliation will occur. But you should ask yourself, why hasn't this occurred over the past five years? Now, Meacham says that the war has shifted to a new form of fighting. But in 2018, the Houthis literally bombed a Saudi Arabia oil tanker which is the core of their economy. And despite this aggressive all-out attack, Saudi Arabia still didn't go to war because both countries know that it would be counterproductive. Uh, you get Yeah. Starting on the Middle East advantage, uh, you've made a lot of arguments here about how Saudi Arabia and Iran don't want to go to war. Obviously, no one wants to go to war, but our scenario is about Saudi Arabia fearing that a Houthi attack was based off of Iranian influence and striking Iran. How, in that case, does Iran stay restrained? First, I kind of disagree that nobody wants to go to war. In the context of the Russia dissent, we've said that Russia wants global leadership, so they are more likely to go to war than your scenario. Second, to answer a question proper, uh, my, my question to that would be, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia has been fearing that for four years. Houthis have been a proxy of the Iranian government since the very beginning of the war. Deepening. That's, that's all right. The it other... might be deepening, but your brink for the conflict was they fear that the attack is caused by Iran. They already have known that the attacks have been caused by Iran for four years. Okay, the humanitarian crisis advantage. You've made a lot of arguments about how there are multiple conflicts the act can't resolve. How does any of this apply to the fact that to our impact about Saudi Arabia striking civilians? Well, the argument is that you're, you're, you're right, that maybe you stop Saudi Arabia striking civilians, but our argument is that civilian deaths will continue as Houthi, the Houthis, Iran, and Hezbollah all up their efforts because all of them now want to try to take over the region. That leads to my second question. The use of the Houthis will expand more. Where did the Houthis expand and who do they fight after their the, only enemy is pulled out of Yemen? Well, our whole argument is that Saudi viewing Saudi Arabia as the Houthis only enemy is a completely wrong representation. Well, of even the if there are other small actors, the Houthis small, if, small actors, you said that Hezbollah is involved. I, I said Hezbollah's in Lebanon, they're not involved. No. You have no evidence that they're involved in Yemen. So that's besides the point. The question is that if the Houthis have a power-sharing arrangement where they get control of the government, why do they want to fight other people My, in the country? Well, first is that Houthis, that agreement won't happen. But let's spot that that agreement does happen. Mm -hmm. How do you think that Houthis, who want the whole region, would cooperate with a southern kingdom the that whole, also wants independence? The southern kingdom is, that's, I mean, that's fine, but the political negotiations... Also, UAE is involved. Thing. The UAE uh, is also... The, sure, the Biden cards in 2018, the UAE has pulled out of the conflict as of this... July? Why? That's actually incorrect. They, did, they, they shifted their effort from the southern border of Saudi Arabia to the north because they were unpopular in that region. It was a strategic move that seemed like a drawdown in that arena, but was more kind of a soft power maneuver. Do you have any evidence else. that the UAE has remained in I mean, after? We've the read evidence that the UAE is involved. You have no evidence to substantiate what you just said, from that the UAE is pulled out.
thing. Uh, why? So pull, post pull out. Why does Iran have incentive to cause instability, and why is Iran because still active in the, the region? The reason that Houthis overthrew the government is because Iran funded them to do so. That's they were red. <laughs> no, it, they, it they were. They got Iranian support. Enlisted Iranian support. That's not true. But they overthrew the government because the government was oppressing. Uh, they only their had interests. the capabilities to do so with Iranian funding. Yes, Otherwise, but why, they have been but able why to do they that. need those capabilities post AF? Well, even if they don't, Iran can stand independent. So first, the dissent outweighs and turns the case. Russia is looking to expand its arms markets now. That plan leaves an opening for Russian arms to fill. Expansion of Russian sales and ceasing American sales causes unchecked Russian expansion, uh, influence expansion and war in the Middle East. This expansion and war draws in absolutely everybody. This causes extinction. It's in a great power of war. Um, they say a lot of things on the Unigdis debate. They say the, the sales are high now. But Russian arms sales in the defense industry are low now. Stratford 19. Russia's defense industry is struggling thanks to decreasing volumes of orders. The decline raises concerns about competitive strength of Russia's defense industry, critical to project as a military power. The slowdown is not short term, expected to become worse. Uh, Russia has benefited from global arms exports. Sales were critical to the country. Russia frequently used arms exports as a political tool, offering weapons at a heavy discount if not entirely free. And group this with their, uh, with their Russia econ low now arguments, the defense industry is absolutely central to the Russian economy and completely outweighs every other sector. This is why they're looking to expand it so heavily. Now on to the link debate. They say the F solved, but no. The plan only creates a new market for Russian arms. I was in the overview, and that's our link from the 1NC. The plan doesn't solve this weapons vacuum that the plan leaves in the Middle East. They say interoperability, but purchasers will choose to sacrifice interoperability with the U.S. after the plan. Bernard 18. Russia and China actively pursue weapon sales as part of an aggressive strategy to expand their spheres of influence. The sale ch uh, creates challenges around interoperability. The more a country purchases from Russia or China, the less able it is to purchase from the U.S. in the future. Mark the card at future. They say shift to China, but Russia is more likely to fill in. They outcompete China and other competitive markets now. Clifford 15. If weapon sales are the next great game, then China is barely on the scoreboard. Despite China's increase in weapon sales, it still only represents 5% of the global arms market. Russia and China are left to compete for market space, and China is struggling. Asian nations don't turn to China as their sole provider of weapons. There's no Chinese neighbor buys weapons at any significant quality from Beijing. Uh, onto the link wall here. The plan causes client states to diversify supply through Russia. The link alone takes out the case. Rounds 19. Several authors call for more selective uh, U.S. arms export decisions. I disagree. Threatening to withhold arms sales to coerce often has the opposite effect, leading cli uh, clients to diversify their arms sourcing. Coercion attempts are, uh, are least likely to be successful when used as a punishment or a threat. Consider Indonesia and Egypt. Egypt uh, agreed to purchase uh, Russian M2s uh, driven by the U.S. embargo. The U.S. lifted the embargo with no change in Egyptian policies. A similar story played out in Indonesia. Indonesia continued sourcing Russian arms even after the U.S. lifted the embargo. Um, and Saudi switches to Russian arms if the U.S. withdraws. Growing influence, uh, hard as uh, V16. A visit to Russia by the Crown Prince paved the way for cooperation. There has been increased coordination between the two. Uh, despite differences, visits offer further testimony to the warming relations between Moscow and Riyadh. For Russia, this is an entry into another state uh, seen as being pro-American, with the potential for eroding Washington's influence in the zero-sum game. For Saudi Arabia, this is a way to signal that as an alternative to being dependent on America. And we have specific links to the regions the plan would cut off. The first is the Middle East. Arms sales are central to Russian expansion. Uh, Warmoth 19. Arms sales are a central component of Russia's engagement in the Middle East. Although U.S. military equipment is seen as the gold standard, countries in the Middle East are often frustrated by the foreign policy conditions attached to U.S. arms sales. As a result, Middle Eastern leaders see Russia as a highly viable alternative. Um, skipping, yeah, no, okay. So, Saudi Arabia wouldn't solve fighting. They just get their weapons elsewhere. That means the AF solves zero of the advantages. That's Tarak. And they say no sales because of Iran. But Russia is looking to expand arms markets by any means necessary. They need it for their economy. It's central. They can overlook other countries in order to expand markets and influence. Um, and Saudi Arabia uh, will shift the Russia out of desperation that kills more civilians, flatly in 19. 
Suspending arms sales to Saudi Arabia could push the kingdom towards Russia. Now, the Saudis see the Yemen conflict in existential terms and will turn to other countries. Agreements if it means they can continue operation. Mark of the card operations going under the impact of it. Uh, they say the impact has already happened, but that's entirely wrong. Our impact is about influence, uh, influence and escalation in the Middle East. They talk about East Europe, where there are more checks uh, to Russian expansion in that area, and there are more checks to escalation in that area. Uh, they say arms sales don't increase power or influence, but expanded arms sales are vital to future Russian expansionism. Uh, Malera 17. Arms exports a major instrument, uh, instrument for Russian power and integral in offsetting the damages by Western sanctions. Um, Russian defense industry remains a fundamental instrument of national power. Uh, there is an inextricable link between foreign military sales and future Russian adventurism. And they say Russia is not a revisionist threat, but Russia will uh, pursue revisionist expansionism as long as it has the economic capacity to do so. That leads to war, paying 17. Russia's system under Putin is oriented to expansionist policies and predicated on recasting Russia as a de facto empire. The inherent revisionism makes anti-Americanism the default option. Russia's security policies begin with a uh, presupposition of conflict. Uh, Russia's conventional and nuclear buildup will continue as long as Russia can afford it. The usual Western hope that arms control will address threats appears fanciful. Putin is willing to violate existing agreements. Crises and conflict are the logical consequences of Putin's expansion's grand strategy. Uh, and extending our impact, Russian revisionism. Uh, expanded Russian influence leads to nuclear war, Gray 17. Strategic relations between Russia and the United States uh, could evolve into a war by accident or by or, or miscount. Russian expansionism must be halted. Putin will take what he can. There's ample evidence to support Russian renewed hegemony. Uh, Putin could miscount a military dependent upon nuclear weapons. A single error uh, could wreak lethal damage. Uh, and of of course, this impact. Um, I mean, if, they, if, they, if Russia launches a nuclear weapon at the United States, obviously that's going to draw out other great powers. Uh, we access a war far larger than their impact in the other. Personally, I wish there's there was a map, and every time they talked about a country there's or, no impact. or a leader or something in history, it pointed to a place on the map, because that's kind of how I think. No so way. maybe um, tomorrow and next week, we'll have our first full time expansion. expansion. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Look yeah. through the yeah. map. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Not tomorrow. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. next week. Eastern yeah. Europe. Yeah. 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 I mean, tomorrow in discussion. Yeah. Next week will be the first train back, man. The real debate, not like, oh, yeah. uh, where are you? Their only answer is that Middle East is key, but that's not true. Very complex because they're more than I've been to something. Once Mr. McAllister posts it, then we'll make it available to it might be, but last year when we did a demo on our I'm not sure that that works. Actually, that's a part of the study. Uh, this debate yeah, I might be a resource for um, debate teams across I, the country. I, I may ask something. That's how much um, uh, this uh, style, and especially this topic, and um, this conversational pace is going to be a guide yeah. for you guys and everyone else to learn about how to debate these issues. Yeah. Boy, I want to have to be this good and how to speak this fast, understand it, all that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> basically, this uh, takes a traditional debate that you might be used to and removes all the fluff and gets right down to the essence of it. 
and it's a concentrated hour and a half that really forces your brain to keep up, think of the responses on the fly, and um, not give too much away until the very end. And ultimately, Mr. Yorko's hope, my hope, Mr. Clark's hope, Mr. Hammer's hope is that you'll jump to the occasion and get excited by the possibility that just like these guys were like you three or four years ago, four or five years ago, and um, brought in the same experience, had the same tendencies and flow on their first day when they had to flow a full debate, had the same kinds of questions, had the potential, though, to learn and practice their skills and do things that um, are, are the kind of critical thinking, organizing, speaking, um, and strategizing that are going to help them in that way. So it's super exciting. It means not everybody goes through eight periods a day and then in their ninth period comes and just is something like this after school and wants to do it. Um, but these guys are motivated. Obviously, they're competitive. They're also very interested and aware of what's happening in the world. Yeah? I was about to say, when I'm sitting in the room class and I'm bored, very bored, and I'm just staring at my desk and I'm like, man, I get to bay after this. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That's what I think. 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 That's
They say that, th that they're dependent on other powers. That, that is true. Our logic evidence says that John Bolton in the U.S. will, present, uh, will press them towards war because he hates Iran, as proven by the collapse of the nuclear deal in Russia, and China will defend Iran once attacked by Saudi Arabia. China and, Ru and Russia won't stay out. They see involvement as necessary to deter the U.S. and to protect a key ally. Obviously, they don't want nuclear war, but they won't know, uh, they won't know. No, it, it escalates going in. The 28 attack proves a brink. More of those attacks are being blamed on Iran, which means that it's more likely that conflict will escalate. Go on to the human crisis advantage. We aren't going for the advantage proper, but none of their arguments take out the Middle East impact. Even if there are many conflicts, Saudi Arabia, if Saudi Arabia pulls out, even if the Houthis are fighting other small militias and secessionists, they will not attack Saudi Arabia, and there is no, no draw into a crisis with Iran. Iran and Hezbollah are increasing involvement only because the Houthis need to help them with the Saudis. They don't need aid after the pullout. They didn't have aid until, after, uh, until the Saudis got involved. Negotiations aren't needed if the Saudis are, uh, are out of the war altogether. Yeah. Do you want to move on? That's it. All right. Nothing else applies. No, none of the other arguments apply to the Middle East advantage. Go on to the rest. Go on to the dis First on, um, um, I guess, first on uniqueness. Uh, Russian infl Russian exports are high now. They just signed uh, they just signed deals with India and China and are expanding their defense industry. Even if they win that their defense industry, uh, sorry, uh, are, are expanding their arms sales. Even if they win that their defense industry is decreasing now, Russian influence is expanding in, into new regions in Asia, which means which is still enough to trigger uh, to make their um, their the scenario for their dissed non unique. We'll. we'll um, and they mishandled the interoperability advantage. US, many many um, of the arms that Saudi Arabia has from the U.S. aren't aren't compatible with Russian arms, which means that the new arms that Russia that Russia sells won't um, won't work for Saudi won't work for Saudi Arabia. Their their card um, the card they uh, they read doesn't answer the fact that it takes to wait it's way too expensive for Russia to retool and revamp all of their arms sales, which means that uh, Saudi Arabia will still. Um, no, we'll, we'll, still, we'll not be able to use their arms. Also, it doesn't. Um, also, their card, their red, didn't didn't have any. They marked it before any of the warrants, so don't provide it. With. Um, yeah, I'll move on to the. You go on to the impact thing. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'll go on to the impact. First, their impact is non-unique. Other other conflicts like like Ukraine and Georgia should have triggered Russia. There should have been proof of Russia. Um, expansionism that should have triggered conflict. Both of these, should, both of these involved the U.S. and its allies, and should have caused powers to draw in. The, their only answer to this is that there are other checks. But first, they have no evidence specific to why the Middle East is a unique region. Second, they haven't named what the checks are. There are still similar regions with the same allies involved in Ukraine and um, and, and Ukraine uh, in Ukraine, and it still could be conflict for the U.S. and Russia. Plus, all their cards say that and. Uh, and are before before uh, events in Crimea, and still say that any spark could trigger a conflict between the U.S. and Putin, which means that there would be um, there there would be drawn. They also dropped that the set, uh, settlement um, uh, settlement uh, settlement solves if the U.S. and um, Saudi Arabia negotiate a peace settlement. That would mean that Saudi Arabia would agree not to accept any more arms, which would mean there would be no uh, uh, no more need for it. This had also extend that Russia is an, is an revisionist country. Most of their evidence is exaggerated. Putin hasn't actually taken in, uh, hasn't actually uh, taken military action. This has been proved by his. Um, Putin doesn't actually escalate action. This has been proved by his past um, actions in Crimea or other regions. All right, two more speeches. Should we let the U.S. sell to Saudi Arabia, or if they don't, will Russia? It's a big question. Um, basically, the negative can't win, as you probably know. By winning, that the plan isn't a great idea. Because the, the affirmative could still win the plan, but okay, I think. And still win the debate, because what they need to prove is that change is at least a little bit necessary. Even a little bit. Um, so the negative's got to win, but somehow removing arm sales makes the status quo worse. And that's what these last two rebuttals are going to try to establish. Is there a um, big enough, good enough reason why change is necessary and the U.S. should stop selling arms to Saudi Arabia? Or is the reverse true, 
and stop the sales to Saudi Arabia would actually make things worse. It would um, benefit Russia unnecessarily, or might even make the conflicts and the actors in the region um, more likely to go to conflict or to fight each other. Um, these last two rebuttals are um, a chance for both sides and their second speakers to really close down the game. So hopefully, as judges, you guys will put your judge ears on and listen to how Aiden and Sam talk to you all about why they've won the debate. Um, the debates happen <clears throat> by starting with a lot of evidence presented. The very first speech was all evidence. It was basically just called on a bunch of witnesses about what's happening and what will happen after the plan stops Marcy. Then there was more evidence than the one at C. 2AC had evidence and arguments, 2NC some evidence, some framing and arguments. But slowly, as you've seen, they're reading less evidence. Because they've got to stop at some point with the witnesses <laughs> and just talk about why they're weighing their case. And that's what you're going to hear in these last few speeches, is how what arguments you should prioritize when you're thinking about who to vote for and why. Yeah? Yeah, sure. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. Do you feel like you guys learned a little bit more about Russia's role in the question. Sure. Okay. Did you learn about uh, maybe who the Houthis, Houthis are and how they, in some ways, are involved in uh, the conflict in Yemen and why they matter so much for the question of whether or not there should be arms? Yes. And I agree that Russia, uh, Iran, were in alliance. Yes. Yeah. Some ways they are. If I were going to draw a map of this debate in particular. There would be a lot of lines, um, a lot of circles around there. Even just within Saudi Arabia or within Yemen, I would have to draw a lot of circles inside each country because there's a lot of internal division, which explains a lot of the dynamics going on. Yeah? So the, the, the speeches they're doing is the last rebuttal, so the two yeah. AR. So negative gets their last speech in a set, and then the affirm and get the final set. So that's the one in R two. Or like the, two in R, two A. Right. Basically, the affirmative has an advantage because they get to speak first and choose the plan, and they get to speak last and have the last word. But Kenny, a lot of people say also the negative has a built-in advantage because they get two speeches in the middle where the affirmative doesn't get to interrupt them in between. They do get to ask some questions, then the negative gets to go again. So there's 13 minutes of negative assault on the affirmative. But then the affirmative, um, Thomas got five minutes to, to respond to. So just thinking about it in terms of time, there's good advantages on both sides. Yeah. So then the last one they did was the one AC or the one AC. Did they, did they you're not supposed to introduce new evidence, right? Not, uh, not typically, or I would say not new arguments, uh, major arguments. You can introduce new evidence if it's responsive to evidence that they um, just heard in the previous, uh, their previous opponent speech on a case by case basis. But you don't want to just get up there and say, scrap what we just said, we're dropping everything in our entire case, we're going to just talk about something new. No, in that case, it would be seen as jettisoning your position. Yeah. Um, so that's not common at all. Because then the judge would probably favor the other side because one side abandoned their position for the most part. Can I have a question? Or are you just ready for one more? Oh, okay. yeah. that was pretty cool. So does anybody know the history of the war in Yemen? A little bit? This makes me want to read a little bit more about it. Because these guys are talking about a narrative of what has happened in the last 10 years. Of a story of a book I have read. So I want to kind of go read the book and watch some videos about how did the conflict start in Yemen? Who are the parties involved? When did the U.S. start selling arms? What arms do they sell? What exactly is the Saudi coalition doing with the arms? And um, all of these questions. So um, it's really making me curious about arms. Yeah, great. Okay, so I'm so kind of confused. So I wanted to bring up arguments you've already said, and you're supposed to say why you're correct and why you're wrong. Right. So like, um, so Ben introduced the first negatives, uh, the negatives for the arguments. Basically, he tried to play defense against the affirmative's uh, case and advantages, and introduce one offensive um, argument to Russia's. 
Then in the next speech, Sam's speech, he played defense against Russia and tried to win his offense. And after that, it was um, uh, basically a race to the finish. Defense, offense, defense, offense. Both sides trying to win their offense and win defense on the other side of the position. Yeah. So back to like uh, bringing up like, new offense, yeah. is it just like not allowed or is it found? Yeah, good question. Um, I, I really like debate because it's always challenging me. Um, and, and also because uh, there's not a rule book. And so part of the challenge of debate is that um, it's not like anything's allowed. You know, there's obviously boundaries on what you should and could do in case. But in terms of a specific rule book um, about uh, technical rules, a lot of times you can try to bend the norm as long as you can defend that doing that is a good idea. If the other side doesn't have reasons why you shouldn't be allowed to, then that's their obligation to debate. And if they don't, you kind of can get away with it. So a lot of times what happens is up until um, Thomas's speech, teams will read evidence. And the other side will say, you read new evidence. And they'll say, no, we were just responding to your new evidence. And so there will be a mini debate within the debate about whether or not that's OK. Kind of like when a lawyer will say, objection, right? Except those objections happen within the speeches. Um, that didn't happen in this case. So there are no rules nor norms. And the norm is that you can read new evidence if it's responsive to the other sides. Um, and again, there are a lot of exceptions to that. Some teams like to read a lot of the evidence later on to throw the other team off. Um, other teams think, why would you um, read new evidence? If your arguments that you made originally are good, stick with those. You shouldn't have to read new evidence if you're reading good evidence to begin with. So it kind of is a question of strategy as much as it is. Is this against the rules, which really is not the case, and it's I'm going to go uh, on the Russia war disadvantage, then the Middle Eastern war advantage, and then the humanitarian crisis advantage. So first the Russia page. And then the and then the Middle Eastern War page, and then the humanitarian press. Not only does the AF not solve the war in Yemen, they actively make it worse by making Russian and Iranian aggression more likely. But that is comparatively worse than the ongoing conflict, because a war with Russia is a thousand times worse than a war with Iran. Remember, neither Iran nor Saudi Arabia has operational nuclear capability, but a war between Russia and the United States would mean thousands of nuclear warheads are used. The AF withdraws from the region. They signal to Russia that there is a vacuum that they can fill, which makes Putin more likely to be aggressive in the Middle East. But the thing is, that makes U.S. overreaction more likely, which increases the risk of war between the United States and Russia. Now, their first argument is that Russian exports are high now. But the countries they name, China and Indonesia, are less than 1% of global sales. Saudi Arabia makes up 20% of all arms sales in the world. Our Stratfor evidence and our Picazio evidence says that Russian exports are capped now, i.e. they are steady and they are not actively increasing the amount of revenue coming to the country. But an arms deal with Saudi Arabia would cause them to be, have billions of dollars in revenue and a new alliance in the Middle East that they will use to expand. Their next argument is that they have Asian arms deals. But our scenario is about U.S. overreaction. U.S. is less, more likely to overreact in the Middle East because we have presence there, but we don't have a comparative amount of presence in Asia. Now, the link debate. Meacham will pontificate in the 2AR about interoperability. But you need to put yourself in the shoes of Saudi Arabia. They have been in a war for four years. They see the war as crucial to regime survival. They see it as hand in hand with the very, with the very risk of their government collapsing. Which means, yes, it is expensive for them to shift to Russia. But they will do anything it takes because they think the war is necessary to win. They have oil, they're oil rich because they make billions of dollars each year. So yes, it is expensive, but you should remember that in the past, countries have swapped before. We stopped selling arms to Egypt and Indonesia, and both of those countries, it was expensive, they shifted to Russia. 
We've read several pieces of evidence in the context of Saudi Arabia that says they perceive the cost to be lower than the cost of winning the war. Now, they say Russian aggression is non-unique, but you should remember that this aggression that occurred was in Ukraine and Georgia, which is distinct from the Middle East because Ukraine and Georgia are near Russia. We're more likely to perceive that as in their own sphere of influence. Our scenario is about Russia overreacting, overreaching outside of their sphere of influence, which uniquely causes war. Now, they say that the act solves war because Saudi Arabia will stop fighting. But this begs the question of the link. We have one that post act Saudi Arabia does not stop fighting. Instead, they buy arms from Russia, which means the act doesn't solve because they can just use Russian arms sales. Now, they say Putin is not revisionist. First, even if they're not broadly revisionist, if they have the money to do so, they will expand. But our pain evidence cites Putin's statements and says that his aggression is motivated by a hatred of America and a reclamation of Russian leadership, which means he'll do anything at all costs to expand Russian influence. Now on the Middle East advantage. The risk of war has been disproven by the past four years of fighting. Now, Nishan will say that cross-border strikes are happening, but you should remember in 2018, cross-border strikes were far worse than they are now. In fact, Houthis bombed a Saudi Arabia tanker and nothing happened, which disproves all of their arguments and proves that this is just an illogical advantage. It is much, much more likely that if a conflict begins to break out, Russia, China, the United States will caution Saudi Arabia and Iran and force them to the diplomatic table. You should remember that Iran and Saudi Arabia are hugely dependent on Western powers. So they'll do anything they can to preserve the alliance, even if it means cooperating with their enemy. Now, Thomas had one answer to this argument. The only answer they had was that Bolton wants to start a war. First, Thomas said that Bolton hates Iran. Even if he hates Iran, that's very different from starting a war. It's, it is in Bolton's interest to make it look like the administration is hard on Iran, but that is very different from starting an all-out war with Iran. You should remember that Trump's whole brand is built on America first. He's decried U.S. intervention and has actively said that he will not increase Middle Eastern troop presence. Starting a war with Iran would go against everything he has promised, which means if a conflict, if a cross-border strike inflames tensions in the short term, U.S. will convince Saudi Arabia and Iran to negotiate peacefully, which means that conflict won't escalate. Uh, 318. All right, I know Ken, you heard about half that debate. He was uh, listening to it selectively by closing his eardrums, <laughs> which is a cool trick. Um, but I'm sure the half of what he got was pretty good. Um, uh, but I don't want to overcomplicate your ability to just take this debate in and let us break it down later. But I will just add one thing to your thinking as judges. Um, there is an emphasis in, in um, this speech and, and in rebuttal speeches on not, in, not allowing the other side to bring something up that they haven't brought up lately. So let's say they brought it up in a very early speech and dropped it. They can't just all of a sudden say, oh yeah, you remember that thing that mattered then, but we haven't really brought up since then? Well, I'm gonna bring it up again. Um, there's an emphasis or a norm in debate on needing to make your argument um, with continuity. So you can't just try a bunch of things. If those don't work, try something else. Because what is the opposition gonna do? Just let you keep bringing up new things over and over again? So there is a norm like, in the later speeches on not allowing either side to say or make brand new major arguments. Now, evidence is different, but arguments is not. The second thing I'll just point out is, um, did you notice how many times in that speech, although you not, might not want the emphasis to be on the affirmative, if you're the negative, you want to talk about what you have to say, how many times did the negative say Sam or say Nietzsche in that speech? Did he bring up the two-way sure. a lot? Yes. It was because he was trying to preempt what he thinks the two A is going to say. Almost as if he knows the strategy and he's trying to say he knows and respond to it. Kind of take the uh, sales, <clears throat> the wind out of the sales to be firm. Yeah. So the point I think the said that uh, 
Egypt or whatever country after we stop? Indonesia, yeah. Okay, Indonesia. That's, that's what we're saying. Okay, that's it. The last speaker. After this, you'll decide whether or not you think, because of the Russia DA and the, and the lack of the likelihood of the war. No, no, you were right. He was wrong. You think the negative one, or because of the likelihood of the Middle East instability occurring and the lack of probability that Russia um, will expand all the way to the plan. Really, there's just two key issues the Russian issue and the Middle East issue. And one side favors keeping our sales, and one side favors not keeping our sales. And that's about it. My name's Bruce John. Is everyone ready? Yes, we are. Order is going to be the Middle Eastern War Advantage, then the Russia Disadvantage. Alright, everyone good? Even a medium risk of the Afghan solve a Middle Eastern conflict coming down outweighs their vague Russia impact disproven time and time again by history. Iranian Saudi Arabia war draws in the US, Russia, and China to a massive exchange of nuclear weapons in the Middle East within the next couple of months. The 1AC ISIS evidence frames this argument for you. It says that instability and tensions between Saudi Arabia, Iran, and the US are escalating in the status quo due to the hardline policies, which makes any small spark in Yemen in 2019 uniquely ripe for an unintended escalation between the countries that would involve all major nations. Think back to the Iraq think back to the Iraq war, which proves that any fears of retaliation or fears of a war coming means that a preemptive invasion or preemptive strike is really likely, even if no one wants to get involved in the first place. Which that miscalculation should frame how you evaluate any war scenario, uh, any war scenario happening in the Middle East specifically. They've made a couple of arguments here that aren't very good. The first argument is about four years disproving it, but they don't assume that Hughes and Wojcik evidence because the Iranian involvement and who the attacks cross border Saudi Arabia are increasing in the status quo. It is true that the war has been going for four years, but it, it, but now it's shifting to a different posture where it's much more likely that Saudi Arabia will blame Iran for sanctioning strikes on their vital assets. The 2018 tanker strike attack that Aiden gives the 2NR may seem persuasive, but it doesn't assume that 2019 is uniquely true. This just provides a brink for us that Saudi Arabia is afraid of the Houthis and afraid of Iran, but further attacks will ensure escalation. And we only have to decrease the risk a little bit because of how big the impact is. Next argument they've made is that U.S. and Russia will urge caution. This is a really bad argument because it doesn't assume current geopolitics. Bolton and Putin will cause overreaction, which they have said on the other page. It's uniquely likely in the Middle East. They, they, they made the arguments that no one wants a war. That is true, but nobody knows that they're entering a massive full-scale war before they do it. They've dropped that a first strike of Saudi Arabia on Iran is inevitable because they fear they're helping the Houthis strike Saudi Arabia, which causes Iranian retaliation, and the U.S. will use that as an excuse to get involved. The uh, Washington evidence says that the U.S. will have any excuse, despite Trump's U.S. America First policy, to contain a power like Iran that they hate, which is proven by pulling out the nuclear deal and tweets. Trump has, well, Trump, there's a very low bar for Trump to attack Iran, given how much he hates them. And Hughes says that outweighs his pledge to be America first. That, that, uh, that outweighs the dissent. I'll go there now. At the top, there's no unique impact that can outweigh a massive risk of a Middle Eastern escalation and how, that would, and how bad that would be. The Russia in the past 10 years has invaded Ukraine and Georgia, both Na members that NATO wanted to enter into, the, the, into their NATO alliance, which proves that it's not a question of Russia's risk influence, but a question of Russia attacking countries that the U.S. wants to incorporate into democratic liberal structures. 
The fact that Russia is already expanding in Eastern Europe, this, and the fact that that is remaining uh, contained now, the U.S. is not retaliating, proves that there's no unique instance which gaining Saudi Arabia as an ally means the U.S. would all of a sudden overreact and attack Russia. It's more likely that Eastern, that it would happen like it did in Eastern Europe, which is fundamentally indistinct, and there would be peaceful uh, settlement of those dis of those disputes. It doesn't apply to the Middle Eastern war scenario because it's a question of uh, Iran and uh, Iranian U.S. tensions that are escalating in the status quo. And in the quote, they don't have any evidence saying that Middle Eastern war is key to Russian influence, which means that you should you should be very biased and skeptical against the chance of a vague Russian expansionist impact being a very being unique. Now, interoperability means there's no link to the dishead. This and they've answered the two NRs that Saudi Arabia wants to buy them, not that they can buy new arms. Think about the arms sales trade, not in terms of going to the store to buy a new iPhone, which comes easily, but in terms of replacing every piece of furniture in your house with a new piece of furniture. You can't do that overnight. It takes time, money, and maybe you won't even have the ability to revamp that all and, and carry on the normal functions. That's how the Saudi military operates. They're fundamentally totally reliant on the U.S. for 98% of their spare parts and their arms and their training, which means that it would take, it would take 10 years and all the money they have that they're burning in Yemen to buy all these Russian arms. The French card says they could just couldn't do it because the Russian and U.S. arms sales are not compatible. Russian arms can't fit in a U.S. plane, so it would require them to revamp their entire military. Anyone who's really good how Saudi Arabia wants to buy new arms, but that doesn't assume that they won't have the capability and they'll decide and they'll just decide to cut their losses and have a status quo they can live with without as strong a military as they had before. The the, the strong as military. Uh, their evidence says they could try, but our evidence says they would fail in that attempt. Even as key regime survival, there's no way Russia would sell if they're not getting any of that money and it takes too long. The French card says that uh, it doesn't take out the app because French says that the spare part and maintenance delay means that their operation would decrease in the short term, which means they can't carry out operations in Yemen for another 20 years, causing peace that solves the app. Good.